Last week, we began our sermon series on Daniel. And the question the book of Daniel is trying to help us answer is, is God God of all? Or is he not? Is he truly sovereign, king over all, or is he not? Most of the time when we read Daniel, we we read it zoomed in too close. We're zoomed in on Daniel himself. But to see the point of the entire book of Daniel, you have to zoom out a bit. You want to watch Daniel. Yes, you do. But you also need to see the, the entire battlefield as you, as you watch the story. Because the story of Daniel is really a story of two kingdoms. The kingdoms of this world represented by Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. And the kingdom of God represented by Daniel and his friends. And then once you place this lens over Daniel, you begin to see that the story has much more depth much more to say to us today than simply saying Daniel is faithful. Everybody go be like Daniel. The book of Daniel gives us perspective. It lifts our eyes and our attention and our hope upward towards the kingdom of God. And this is needed now as much as it was in Daniel's own day. You'll recall that King Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem and took Daniel and his friends to exile in Babylon He also ransacked the temple, desecrating it and stealing sacred vessels and putting them into his own temple. This is because he believed that he had beaten Judah and Israel's God. And by all external appearances, he thought he had. And the book of Daniel sets up this tension from just the first couple of verses. Is Israel's God truly God? Is he truly sovereign? Is the Babylonian king greater or the Babylonian God stronger? Daniel and his friends have lost their homeland and their freedom. Now the kingdom of Babylon is going to war against the hearts and minds of the people of God. They're going to seek to pressure Daniel and his friends into conformity to this new culture. They want them to forget their God and forsake their faith. And remember that when this happens, Daniel is somewhere between 13 and 16 years old. And that's going to play an important part today. So let's get into the text and see what we can learn from the remainder of chapter 1. Please turn in your Bibles to Daniel 1. We'll begin with verse 3, which we read last week. So, like I said last week, if you find Isaiah and Jeremiah, keep going. You find Ezekiel, Daniel's next. If you hit Hosea, you've gone too far. All right. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, used without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel, he called Belshazzar, Hananiah, he called Shadrach, Mishael, he called Meshach, and Azariah, he called Abednego. Last week we saw that one of the pressures Daniel and his friends face in Babylon is the pressure to change their thinking. He and his friends were were to undergo three years of re-education into Babylonian culture, in literature and in language and undoubtedly in Babylonian occult religion. But they were already highly educated, weren't they? Verse 4 mentions eight specific traits that the king was looking for in the youth that he chose for this re-education. They were already skillful in wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, and learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. But this is a concerted effort to drive the faith from these young men. This wasn't random. 
It was an effort to reorient their entire identity away from their God and to the Babylonian way of life. And this is underscored by the way the chief of the eunuchs changed their names. And that is key to understanding what's happening here. Names are important. Names have power. Names convey identity. If I ask you your name, you should sell me Mark or Kelly or John. If I call you by another name, what would you say? That's not me. That's not me. So names convey identity. The government may identify you with a number, but God identifies you by your name. Isaiah 43, 1, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Names matter. And the Babylonians knew this, which is why they renamed them. Daniel means God is my judge. That's his given name. His new name is Belteshazzar, which means may Bel protect his life. Bel is one of the gods of Babylon. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. His name is changed to Shadrach, which means Aku is gracious. Aku is a Sumerian moon god. Mishael means who is what God is or who is like God. And his name is changed to Meshach, which means who is like Aku. And Azariah means Yahweh is my helper. And his name is changed to Abednego, which means the servant of Nebo, which is yet another Babylonian god. So they are retrained and they are renamed, all in an attempt to make them forget their god. But more than that, this is an attempt by the Babylonians to change their identity. They want Daniel and their friends to change the deepest understanding of themselves, their purpose in life, their value, the very meaning of who they are, to something other than the children of God. The Babylonians may have sacked sacked Jerusalem, but their assault on God's kingdom is not complete until they have conquered the hearts and the minds of the people of God. So they are re-educated. They are renamed. And next, Daniel and his friends are also pressured into changing their way of living to pull them away from obedience to their God. That's the whole point of of changing their thinking, right? If you change the way you think, then by nature you change how you live. So they are looking for Daniel and his friends to change their concept of right and wrong, to change their concept of God and what is pleasing to God. They want them to live by the rules and the attitudes of the Babylonian kingdom. In verse 5, it says, The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and the, the wine that he drank. And in today's section, we read, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Daniel draws a line here. He firmly declines. Daniel has not surrendered his way of thinking, and he isn't about to surrender his way of living And it doesn't appear that Daniel and his friends were some sort of contentious troublemakers. It's the opposite, really. Daniel sat in the classes. Daniel didn't protest at the new name. But he would not knowingly sin against the living God. He would rather risk the displeasure of the king than risk the displeasure of God. By the grace and power of God, his identity remains intact. How? Because in the provision and love of God, his identity had been firmly set. If Daniel was about 16 years old when Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem, then he would have been a boy under the reign of King Josiah. Under Josiah's reign, Israel had experienced a great renewal. We might even call it a revival. They had rediscovered the word of God. They sought to live in faithfulness as the people of God. Daniel, you see, had been catechized. He had been taught the faith. To put it in our terms, he had a healthy church. 
then taught and emphasized the word of God for the people of God. And Daniel absorbed this as a boy. One of the reasons I emphasize this so much is because I know what it is like not to have it. When I was growing up, the church did not catechize me. Sunday school was coloring pictures of Noah, Jonah, and Jesus, and that's about it. Youth group was watching movies, many of which were inappropriate. It wasn't until college that I was discipled and catechized by Baptist friends who knew the Lord and knew their Bible. And I know I'm not alone in that experience. Many of us were not catechized when we were young. And although we came to church, we really didn't have the foundational teaching of the faith clearly taught to us. And that's one of the reasons we've gone through the catechism in our small groups, why we have done a series on the book of homilies, why we are going through the 39 articles in class. Right after this service, by the way, just so you know. Because without solid foundational teaching, what happens? Our identity becomes easily muddled. We try to figure out things on our own. And so many Christians end up taking various influences from around them in order to cope with life and fill in the gaps in their spiritual knowledge. So they grab a little little Eastern mysticism a little enneagram, a little medieval Roman superstition, a little political ideology, a little pop psychology, and of course, a little Jesus. And they try to cobble together whatever worldview and an identity that makes sense. But the problem is this, friends. It's part Bible and part Babylon. It just doesn't work. Catechesis for our children is very important, and it's something that happens at church and at home. Home is the primary place for the catechesis of our children, and the church comes alongside and tries to help that and support that. But it can't happen in the two hours a week that we're here. Catechesis for adults is also crucially important because many of us were never really catechized when we were younger. We need to understand that the kingdoms of Babylon and the kingdom of heaven are still in conflict around us. Babylon still seeks to bend the thoughts and actions of the people of God and wants them to forget who they are as God's children to lose their identity. I love the way Peter puts it in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says to the church, Take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. I love that. Lose your own stability. He says, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus. But we also need to see the grace and activity of our sovereign and good God. Daniel keeps his true identity in view and refuses to cross the line of sin by not eating the king's food. But look at what happens in verse 9. Now, if God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, Daniel took the risk and trusted God to work, and he did. At the end of this 10-day dietary experiment, Daniel and his friends appear more healthy than their counterparts who took the king's food. It's actually funny the way it is phrased. At the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. It makes me laugh because about 15 years ago, there was the Daniel diet plan. (laughs) I'm like, babe, we got to lay off the vegetables. Because you know what happened to Daniel and those guys is they got fatter in appearance. (laughs) Daniel and his friends appear more healthy. 
And verse 17 says, To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And verse 20 says that at the end of this three-year re-education, the king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. Remember last week when we said that Nebuchadnezzar's victory was because God gave it? Verse 2 of chapter 1. Look again at the, in these verses what we've seen. God had caused. God gave. God gave knowledge and understanding. God is at work in Babylon among his people. And their knowledge, it says, was better in every way. Ten times better than the supposedly greater Babylonian knowledge. Do you see? God is truly God. His kingdom is truly supreme. And this is going to play out. I cannot wait till we get to chapter 2. Because this is going to become clearer and clearer as we go. There's a lot of talk today in our world, in our own day, about identity. Social identity. Political identity. Sexual identity. National identity. And there's a tremendous amount of pressure on us as people, particularly our young people, to choose some identity that will define them and distinguish them. And most of those alternate identities explicitly reject any influence of God, true religion, or the Bible. Babylon is still at work. But any objective look around the social landscape of today, just a casual survey of news headlines, and you'll see this is failing. It's failing. We are a society in crisis. We are a people in free fall. Violence, immorality, vulgarity, hard-heartedness, selfishness, brokenness, pain, depression, anxiety are all truly a true pandemic of the modern day. But I suggest to you that much of this, much of this is primarily a crisis of identity. We don't know who we truly are. We don't know or we've forgotten who we truly are and who are truly made to be. Humanity, you see, seeks the things of Babylon because it thinks it was made for Babylon. It thinks Babylon is the key to its identity. For at least four generations, we have taught children the values of Babylon. So it is no surprise where we find ourselves today with a confused sense of self as we seek ultimate meaning in things like success and politics, sexual expression and money, drugs, popularity, and social media platforms. But Babylon never seems to satisfy. Why? Because we weren't made for Babylon. You weren't made for Babylon. Our identity is not found in Babylon. We were made for the kingdom of God. You were made for the kingdom of God. Our identity is found in Jesus Christ who died and rose for us that we may have life and have it abundantly. Is God truly God? Yes, he is. Is God truly sovereign? Yes, he is. Is God truly good? Yes, he is. Is his kingdom truly supreme? Yes, it is. Daniel and his friends knew this. Despite all that they had experienced and suffered and lost, these were their convictions. Their flag was planted deeply into the soil of the kingdom of God. May ours be planted there as well. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.